those men that I looked up to, these were the men that I called Ammu, which means uncle, they would uh, eventually be convicted of placing a van filled with 1,500 pounds of explosives into the sublevel parking lot of the World Trade Center's North Tower, causing an explosion that killed six people and injured over a thousand others. It saddens me to think that had they not committed this crime, the innocent victims killed in the attack would be at home spending time with their loved ones. Instead, their families are forced to live their lives without their guidance and companionship. I was seven years old when my father went to prison. And there's not a day that goes by that I don't wish he'd chosen a peaceful life with his family. Instead, he exposed me from a very young age to the intolerance and radical nature of extremism. And yet, I stand before you all today with this simple message. That no matter the level of violence you've been exposed to, it doesn't have to define your character. That in all of us is the ability to change our paths. I spent years of my young life visiting him in different prisons. Rikers Island, the federal prison in Manhattan, uh, and even entire family weekends inside Attica State Penitentiary. I can still remember my first trip to Rikers like it was yesterday. Uh, it was a dull gray morning. Uh, we'd gotten up extra early to make the trip into New York City. And my family and I, we climbed into our old wood paneled station wagon and started off. I remember my nervousness as we entered the Rikers Island parking lot. Uh, light mist seemed to cut us off from the rest of the world. The tall gray walls and barbed wire fences only added to the atmosphere. Because my father had been in the hospital recuperating from his wounds, it had been several weeks since I'd last seen him. And it was pretty obvious, even to a seven-year-old, that this was going to be a strange day. A bus took us across a bridge to the main facility where we were taken into a building and frisked for any prohibited items. We were walked down a long hallway lined with cells that provided privacy for the families visiting inmates. And as one of the guards opened a door to the cell, I saw my father sitting, uh, wearing an orange jumpsuit, sitting in a plastic chair. And he stood up and smiled. He took his time giving me a hug, and then we sat down across from each other at the table. The first thing I noticed was the long surgical scar that ran across his chest and up his neck, where the doctors had tried to remove the bullet that was lodged inside him. I remember that whole time trying not to stare at it. And while he and my mother sat in conversation, I sat wondering how our family would be affected by his being in prison. That first trip to visit him was nerve-wracking, but as the weeks turned into months, it all became routine to have to pass through armed guards and barbed fences in order to see my father. This went on for years, but eventually my mother remarried, and we decided as a family to discontinue any further contact with my father. We also changed our names so as to hide our, our identity from the community in which we lived, it's certainly unusual when an American citizen admits to being the son of the first member of a bin Laden organization to shed blood on American soil. Shame for what my father had done and fear for how I would be judged for his actions had caused me to hide my identity from most of those who knew me. I realized at a young age I had to be careful who I told my life story to. People's reactions have ranged from nervous laughter and shock to outright threats against my life. Uh, I even once sustained a defensive wound across my hand as I tried grabbing the knife from someone I thought was a friend uh, as he lunged at me exclaiming, I'd be doing this country a service if I killed you. Luckily I was able to escape without any serious injury. By the time I turned 19, I had already moved 20 times in my life. That instability during my childhood didn't really provide an opportunity to make many friends. And each time I'd meet one or two people I began to feel comfortable around, it was time to pack up and move to the next town. And being the perpetual new kid at school, I was frequently the target of bullies. So for the most part, I spent my time at home 
reading books and watching TV or playing video games. For those reasons, my social skills were lacking, to say the least. And growing up in a bigoted household, I wasn't prepared for the real world. I'd been raised to judge people based on arbitrary measurements like a person's race or their religion. One of the major turning points in my life came when I found a summer job at Busch Gardens, an amusement park in Florida. The exposure to so many different faiths and cultures was fundamental to the development of my character. I was able to contrast the stereotypes that I'd been taught as a child with real life experience and interaction. And it didn't take long to realize that for the most part, uh, it didn't take long for me to realize the disservice that I was doing to myself and to those I was compelled to judge. Being exposed to the outside world helped me to understand how little a person's race or religion or sexual orientation has to do with the formation of one's character. I had a discussion with my mother not long after about how my worldview was starting to change. And she said something to me that I will hold dear to my heart for as long as I live. She looked at me with the weary eyes of someone who'd experienced enough dogmatism to last a lifetime and said, I'm tired of hating people. And it sounds so simple, but it was so profound for me that I often fight back tears just thinking about it. It served to me as a reminder that it is our duty to protect the freedoms afforded to us. And as a society, we must work together in order to achieve those goals. Remember that extremism thrives on the fringes of society. When we divide people into smaller and smaller groups based on one arbitrary distinction or another, we create communities ingrained with hostility toward one another. This is why I promote interfaith dialogue because I believe it's one of the most useful tools for encouraging solidarity within our community. And when I say dialogue, I don't mean that we pile everyone into a room to debate who's right and who's wrong. All I'm talking about is simple interaction, sharing a meal together, or working together on a community project. It not only aids in dispelling false stereotypes and prejudices, it helps to create stronger, safer communities. For a time, uh, I chose not to come out with my story because I was ashamed for what my father had done. But today, most times you hear about Islam or the Middle East in the news, it's usually related to some form of extremist behavior. And I knew that I could use my story to combat those negative stereotypes. If I could show people that although I had been exposed to this violent, intolerant ideology that I didn't become fanaticized, that if I could choose to promote peace, then anyone can. As I mature, I realize the only way that I can overcome the challenges of my past, which at times has been crippling, is to help others understand that hatred only produces more hate. But belief in nonviolence at least provides an opportunity to heal. Those cycles of violence, no matter how old, don't have to continue forever. I am not my father, and with that simple fact, I stand here as proof that violence isn't inherent in one's religion or race, nor is it mandated that the son must follow the ways of his father. And should we fulfill our obligation to live peacefully and to put in the work needed in order to obtain peace, however difficult it can sometimes be, that ultimately will leave this earth a better place for the ones we love. Thank you. happy to answer uh, any questions that you may have. I believe uh, we've got some of the mic running around. I'm Jesse. Um, <laughs> talk about that the, um, the extremist Muslim group is um, overly represented in the media. What, what, is, what are moderate Muslims doing to make themselves better represented and to publicize themselves more? 
Well, that's a great question. Uh, a lot of the complaints that I get are the fact that people don't see moderate Muslims uh, in the media or, or out there um, trying to promote moderate ideals, trying to take attention away from these extremists. Um, that's an extremely difficult task, uh, especially when we seem to hyper-focus on the more violent aspects of a religion. Um, I can tell you just from personal experience, beyond the fact that you can very easily um, go online and, and look up many, many groups uh, that condemn the sorts of violence that these extremists uh, promote. Uh, but just in my own experiences, um, spending time in peace organizations or going to universities and high schools, uh, that there are groups and, and Muslims all over who added tremendous um, support to me for what I've been doing and who uh, separately themselves are members of groups that are constantly trying to promote interfaith dialogue, uh, to try and break down barriers between uh, religions and, and races and that sort of thing. So it's really very prevalent. Um, it's, it's something as simple as uh, Googling it, um, you know, just because we don't see it necessarily on television all that much. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean that it, it doesn't exist. Someone else, it's hard for me to see hands if there are hands up. Somebody up there. Like the, did your father plan nine eleven? Uh, no, no, he didn't. Um, he was uh, in prison for about 13 years uh, when 9-11 happened. Um, he, by that point, really did not have much communication with uh, uh, any of the, the men that he'd been in communication with before. In fact, uh, for the time that he was in prison between the Kahana assassination and the bombing of the World Trade Center, he'd had many visits from many of the men that were eventually convicted of the bombing. But after that, uh, once they were all convicted of the World Trade Center bombing, uh, eventually he was put into solitary confinement. And in fact, even after 9-11, he spent many years uh, in the box, as they call it. Someone else? Uh, okay. Um, did you press charges on the guy who like attacked you?